Hi, good morning. It is Thursday. It's a little past 9.30 today, but this is our Thursday edition live stream here at Rogers Gardens. Uh, you usually see me introducing to you the plant of the week. That's what we've been doing um, for the summer. Um, so today I have this beautiful plant for you. I am Sarah Smith. I'm a horticulturalist here at Rogers Gardens, and let's get into it. So it is uh, the Hummingbird Summer. So it's an awesome program that we've been doing here at Rogers where we gather all the most uh, hummingbird attracting plants that we have here and we kind of put them all in one area which is kind of amazing because the hummingbirds definitely get the memo and they just start swarming the area which is really fun um, but we're we're trying to encourage people to start planting with a purpose so having a garden actually has meaning to it and you just got buzzed by a hummingbird which is pretty awesome uh, there's a little one right next to me so it's so funny because they all come up they kind of get a little scared when the mic goes on but then they kind of calm down and start coming around um, but um, um, we're trying to encourage people to plant things that are going to attract wildlife into our garden. We have so much, uh, you know, climate change and uh, deforestation going on and, and less and less native habitats for all the animals and stuff. And I think people are starting to kind of finally realize that we need to start planting stuff that actually attracts in uh, all the wildlife. So no more sterile gardens, right? So gardens with life and energy and color. I mean, hummingbirds and butterflies and bees love color. So it's really fun for us too because they're all beautiful plants right uh so it's been really really a fun thing that we're doing here we have 40 different feeders out all over the place we sell really amazing hummingbird nectar that's really healthy for the hummingbirds uh you want to stay away from things that have corn syrup and red dye and all that kind of scary stuff in it because the hummingbirds can't digest that it's not good for them uh, so we're trying to kind of educate people too as well so people have an understanding uh, of what to plant and how to treat the wildlife that we do attract into our garden so uh, if you haven't looked through uh, our YouTube page or anything like that. We've recently been on the news about the um, the uh, monarchs being put on the endangered species list. So there's a lot of uh, really important stuff to know about gardening uh, and to stay educated on. And that is our goal here at Rogers. So uh, I'm really, really lucky to work for a place that uh, really works hard on making sure that everybody understands what's going on in the world and what we can do to help and also make our homes and gardens beautiful in a place we actually want to be in, right? So uh, this plant is called Tacoma. Uh, this is a hummingbird attracting plant. The bees like it too, butterflies like it as well. Um, but it's a really, really beautiful uh, flower. And these are dwarf varieties. So most Tacoma gets really kind of big. So I think <laughs> we finally got one to come up. <laughs> um, uh, I think a lot of people kind of shy away from Tacoma typically because it can get pretty big. And you can see Tacoma in all different kinds of forms. So a lot of times uh, they call it orange trumpet bush, uh, but you can also get it shaped like a tree as well. So the larger varieties, these are dwarf ones though. So if you're like, I love it, but I just don't have space for it. These are the more dwarf varieties. So those are the ones I'm gonna really talk about today, but you can get it uh, in all kinds of forms. You can even have it a spellade where it looks like a vine and it's tied to something. Um, um, it doesn't naturally vine, so it takes a little bit of work to do that, but you could put it over an arch, you could uh, cut it like a little mini tree, so it's what we call patio trees, or you have it in bush form. So these varieties are the dwarf varieties um, that I'm gonna show you here. Uh, and this one right here is called Oompa Loompa. I love, love, love the name, it's so cute. This is the one I have in my hat. Uh, so Oompa Loompa, we have them one gallons and five gallons. There's a five gallon behind here. Isn't this super cute? I love it so much. The color is so beautiful. Uh, I have it paired with the Disneyland rose and some lavender here. I love oranges and purples together because they just pop the colors together. Um, Oompa Loompa only gets four by four uh, feet wide, so it's not a really, really big one. And again, you can kind of keep it trimmed up a little bit. If you want it to look like a little mini tree, you could do that. Uh, if you want to tie it to an arbor or an arch or a trellis, you could do that, which is really kind of cool. So it's, it's a really neat plant in that way. And I love how deep green the foliage is because it really makes the color pop. Uh, I think that's really beautiful. Um, and then this other variety, and that's what I have back here too. It's another Oompa Loompa. Um, this one here is called uh, Cape Town Pink Salmon. We just got this one in. Uh, this is also a dwarf type, a little bit bigger um, than this one. So this one gets to be about five by three. So this one would really work well for trellising purposes because it is narrower than it is tall, whereas this one's a little bit more bushy. Uh, but isn't that really beautiful? So this is another Tacoma as well. Uh, 
uh, and another dwarf type Tacoma too. Um, so really beautiful peachy kind of colors. That seems to be kind of really the hot color at the moment is those kind of blushy peaches. Everybody really loves that. If you've seen our flower of the year, which is Princess Charlene de Monaco, it's got that kind of vibe to it as well. So just a beautiful, beautiful flower. I absolutely love that color. So pretty, right? Um, so Tacoma actually uh, is native to Texas and to Mexico. So that will give you right there a good view of how to treat this plant, right? So if we know where they're native to, uh, that right there gives you all the kind of information you really kind of need to know about what it means. So uh, you guessed it, full sun, um, six hours or more. So it can take some shade, um, but we're talking minimal shade. The more shady it is, you're gonna start sacrificing flowers excuse me, and uh, it'll get a little thinner. So uh, we wanna stay away from that. Uh, it wants really good, well-drained soil, but fertile soil. And it's one of the ones that's kind of cool because in a way it could sort of take anything when it comes to watering habits and it can kind of take anything when it comes to fertilizing and wants to be well draining that's really kind of key but it can take very low water but it can handle uh, more water than that so if you've got an area of your garden where um, you know we're all on the water restrictions here but you're still uh, watering it kind of more on the frequent side of the water restrictions most places they want you to do two to three times a week which still in my opinion is kind of a lot <laughs> still three times a week I water my garden mostly like once maybe twice a week um, but uh, if you're watering right your plants are really nice and established and that is low and slow we tell you that all the time low and slow so you want to uh, get your water low into the soil slowly into the soil and then cut it for a few days so this can really handle that as well uh, but if you have an area where it's running three times a week it'll also be okay with that too so it's kind of really nice in that regard that it's um, very flexible which is really kind of amazing and when it comes to fertilizing same thing um, if you're fertilizing and you really want to kind of push the flowers you're always looking for that middle number to be high so this is a good example right here, uh, four, six, two. So that middle number is high. That's gonna be what uh, is gonna encourage the bloom. So if you have a rose and flower fertilizer, you can use that as well. Uh, that would work really well too, because uh, that middle number is higher. Um, and also a little bit of acidity. They can appreciate a little bit of acidity. So you can use the acid mix that we saw here. If you already got it at home, awesome. You can alternate between this and the acid mix. Uh, maybe do the acid mix, maybe like twice a year on it. You wanna fertilize when you start seeing flowers. Uh, flowers are gonna um, start showing up in the springtime and they go all the way to fall. Um, or you can also just throw coffee grounds on there. I do that a lot. So uh, I hate putting anything in my trash can if I don't have to. <laughs> So I put coffee grounds on all different kinds of things in my garden, but this can handle some of the coffee grounds too. So you don't have to worry yeah. about over acidifying it or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so spring through fall blooms, which is amazing. So you have flowers for a really long period of time, which is super fantastic. And when it comes to trimming this, depending on what kind of form uh, you're keeping it in, uh, some of them are gonna be pruned harder. If you're trying to get that tree form, you're gonna find that kind of tr central trunk to it and start cutting away the stuff coming off of that so you can can make it look like a little mini tree if you're keeping it espaliate on something uh, you're gonna go back and make sure you start tying it to whatever you're training it to if you're just keeping it bush form uh, you want to do your trim back in the late winter time so before spring uh, late winter just give it a nice trim down uh, just to keep it shapely and nice deadheading is not essential to this but looks nice and of course is always going to encourage some more flowers but it's not one of those ones that you have to keep it deadheaded all the time or else it really looks rangy or you sacrifice a lot of plumes you really won't with this one uh, but i always love going through and deadheading and uh i'm always kind of cheating because i'm deadheading to bring things in the house <laughs> i love putting flowers in my hat i love bringing flowers in my home uh so this is a fun one to cut because because you do get like long kind of crazy flowers on it and I just love 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 this hot pretty color um, this has always really been kind of my favorite color palette these really kind of vibrant oranges and things um, mixed with really deep pretty colors like purples and blues I love that together um, but these will work well for that kind of situation too and just keeping them deadheaded to keep them looking nice which is really fantastic but the hummingbirds absolutely adore this plant as well as the bees and the butterflies to um, come to it you're not gonna see as much butterfly uh, activity on this as you would some of our other hummingbird plants like the lantana and the pentas butterflies are looking for shallow flowers so these are a little deep for them but they will still come up to it um 
and when it comes to pests, not a lot of pests too. So it's another good one for if you want easy, kind of plant it and sort of forget it and walk away from it, this is a good one for you um, in that regard too because it doesn't really get a lot of pest problems. It doesn't get a lot of mildew problems. Uh, we do suffer from that on some of the plants because of how coastal we are, um, but this one is not one that has issues with that, which is really uh, nice because it's less uh, maintenance for you. Um, and then um, pest problems are really the only thing that you typically will see on these is maybe a little bit of scale here and there um, but if you've got that in your garden it's because your garden's stressed basically so when you start seeing things like scale and aphids and mealybugs and things like that uh, partially it's your garden is stressed it's people and plants are very similar so if we don't treat ourselves well we don't eat well we don't drink enough water we don't rest enough that's when we start getting run down and we get sick and it's really hard for us to kick it plants are exactly the same way so if your plants are water stressed because you're really irregularly watering or you're not fertilizing well or you've planted an area that's not really great for it you've crowded it with other plants or you've planted an area that's not getting enough sun that's when you start seeing those issues uh, so the way to combat that is just by having a healthy garden uh, making sure you're fertilizing and doing all those things we have a monthly checklist that you should definitely check out because that monthly ch checklist we do it the first Saturday of every single month and we'll tell you all the things you need to do for almost every single kind of plant you have in your garden so if you're new to this or you just realize you know I don't really pay enough attention to my garden I'm not treating things the way I think they're supposed to or I always have pest problems on everything check out that monthly checklist because that'll tell you the things to do. Uh, David Rizzo does a fantastic job on that and he'll tell you everything you need to know for your garden. So um, if you do see that kind of uh, situation going on in your plant, you're seeing a little bit of aphids, you're seeing a little bit of scale, uh, mostly scales, what you'll see on this sometime aphid, but very rarely. Um, make sure that you're checking your water, make sure that your sprinklers aren't clogged up somewhere or it's not getting overwatered, uh, and start fertilizing and putting down worm castings. Worm castings is gold I'm telling you worm castings is fantastic you should put it on everything in your garden uh, the plants take up an enzyme from it uh, worm castings is a fancy word for worm poop <laughs> don't be scared it looks just like soil it doesn't smell bad or anything like that um, but uh, it's uh, all the stuff that the earthworms all the natural materials that earthworms break down so vegetables fruits plant material all that kind of stuff and they break it down and there's an enzyme in it that the plants bring up and it makes it not tasty to the things like white fly and um scale and things like that so if you put that down regularly in your garden just a nice thin layer i do it every six months or so in my garden i just put a nice thin layer down that will definitely help if you get to the point where you're like "Ooh, i've got the scale now already worm castings is great put it down um, but it's not going to get rid of the scale that you already have uh take down spray so this is fantastic. This is from Monterey. Uh, take down spray will definitely help on that. Um, give it a really hard spray with a hose, kind of knock some of the stuff off and add a little bit of this. That will definitely help and spray that on there. Uh, but take down spray is really awesome. Has um, a little bit of canola oil, so it's got a thin oil in there. Um, also has uh, the paraffins in there too, which will help too. So um, of course we are live. So if we have any questions, we'll answer those questions for you. And if you came in a little bit late, that's okay. Still put your questions down below and we'll answer those uh, for you after the fact. But do we have any current questions? Not at right this now? time. Okay, awesome. So I explained myself really well then. <laughs> so yeah, plant of the week, Tacoma, uh, super beautiful. This variety, Oompa Loompa, I think the name is super funny, super cute. I love, love, love the color of this one. And I have to keep looking at this one. It's salmon something. This is the new one that just came in. Salmon, Cape Town uh, salmon pink. Uh, super pretty um, and the really beautiful foliage on this one and this one is taller than it is wide this one's gonna be more like a wide little stumpy Oompa Loompa type bush <laughs> um, this one is tall and narrow so very good for a uh, or tying on to something uh, or keeping it with some height but some narrowness behind other plants so you have that kind of little peekaboo behind other uh really beautiful plants too so and like i said if you got any more questions and i'm not answering those for you right now uh just put them down below uh and then if you know anybody who's super into hummingbirds you've got that hummingbird uh fanatic friend or uh you know someone who's an avid birder make sure you tag them down below so they know what we have going on here at rogers because if you come in we have so much hummingbird activity and a lot of bee activity there's a little beautiful bumblebee over here here uh, going for all the salvias uh, so it's really really fun here and then the humming or the butterfly population is really starting to 
start coming in for all the milkweed. We still have that milkweed exchange program going on. So if you have the tropical milkweed at home, and if you don't know about this yet, stop what you're doing right now and go check out our website because there's a lot of information about that. If you've got a milkweed that's blooming in your garden that is red or orange, uh, my favorite colors, unfortunately, or yellow, you got the wrong kind of milkweed. So make sure you go onto our website and check out the information we have there. And we're doing an exchange program. So even if you do have it and you're like, oh no, I have it. Well, I don't want to go spend money on new ones. You can dig that one up, come bring it into here to Rogers Gardens, pick up a native milkweed, which is the correct milkweed for the monarchs here. And it's the California native milkweed uh, and go to the registers and they will exchange it for you for free, which is pretty amazing. Looks like maybe we do have a question finally rolling in. We have one question here from Virginia yeah. Wong. She's asking, so how do you keep the bees out of the hummingbird feeders? Okay, so that is really hard to do. Uh, depends on the type of feeder you have. The smaller um, the opening is, the better. But honestly, what's really funny is the hummingbirds will chase the bees away. So um, I see it here all the time. It's really hilarious to me. And the butterflies too. They, the hummingbirds are super territorial. So I will watch them actually chase butterflies and bees away from plants uh, because they're territorial. It's really difficult to keep the bees away. Uh, for ants, there are ways to help with that. You can put Tanglefoot on the bottom of whatever they're crawling up, which is sticky, so they can't get past that. Uh, Vaseline on poles and stuff will also work for um, the ants, but with the bees, there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. If you've got bees around, they're gonna come to it. So it's just a circle of life and part of the, the ecosystem. And it's good because you're actually giving the bees something as well, so you're helping feed the bees, which is important because obviously we need to save the bees as well. Um, but the hummingbirds will chase the bees away. So if the hummingbirds have already figured out your feeder, don't worry about it because they will chase them away so we'll just have to live with the bees unfortunately um, but don't worry about it too much because the hummingbirds will not be scared off by a bee <laughs> they're not scared off by anything not each other either that's why you only see them chasing each other around I can hear so much activity around me right now because they're all chasing each other away trying to fight over the plants which is super funny so we have another question yes Nancy's asking how big do the plants get and how much are they? Okay, so um, these, depending on the variety, there's really, really tall ones. It can be about 12 feet tall. Uh, these particular ones are the dwarf ones. Um, the Oompa Loompas here are four by four. That's the orange one. Uh, so as tall as they are wide, of course, they are very shapeable and very um, malleable. You can really kind of make them almost any shape really that you want to, to a degree, of course, but you can almost make them like little mini trees. You can keep them very bushy or you can tie, to this, tie them to something. Um, the small ones range from 14 uh, to 18.99. And then the larger five gallon here is 49.99. Um, this one is uh, three feet by five. I gotta keep checking this one because this one's a new one for me. Uh, yeah, three wide, five tall. Um, so this one is taller than it is wide, which makes it again, super good. Like if you had an arch like this and you wanted to grow onto an arch, you can absolutely do that because uh, they do, um, there are very soft and very malleable. So very good for tying against espaliers. They're not a vine. Uh, so it is something you'll have to tie, but similarly, like how you would with like a, a climbing rose, even climbing roses don't really vine. They're just more like canes, right? Or when people do that to uh, citrus or apples, it would be the same kind of thing, but they would work really well for that, which is uh, pretty amazing. And the color of this one's so pretty too. I love this color, that that peachy apricot color is super hot right now. So uh, really, really pretty. Like if you imagine that with like a Princess Charlene de Monaco, it'd be super, super pretty together. Um, but there are other varieties as well. We have the tall big guys too. We even have ones that are already shaped like trees that are pretty big. So I've just been uh, showing you all the dwarf varieties as well. So, oh, now we're starting to get questions. Okay, what else do we got? Um, we have a question on what was the name of the middle Tacoma, the pink blush? This one, this is the salmon. So uh, Cape Town Salmon Pink is the variety here. Uh, and look at the foliage. The foliage is very different than the other one too. Uh, so this is not like the Tacoma stands. This is the Compensus variety. These ones, it's funny. These ones are like Tacoma, uh, Tacoma sands. However, 
it's like a weird hybrid. So when you try to look up what the true botanical is, which really nobody needs to know except for like a horticulturist like me who gets kind of hung up on those things. But they say, we think it's a Tacoma Sands variety, but they're not even sure. I'm pretty sure that it is, but uh, scientifically, they're not 100% sure about that. So uh, Oompa Loompa and uh, Cape Town uh, Salmon Pink. So we only have these ones in the smaller containers right now. We don't have larger. This is like a two gallon. This is not exactly a one gallon, uh, but really pretty. Okay, more questions. Um, can they take full sun? Yes, they need full sun. In fact, six hours at the very least. Uh, if you have it in too much shade, they're not going to be happy. So these are, if you're coming in a little bit late, these are native to Texas and to Mexico. So think that type of exposure. They like it hot. They like full sun. Uh, they're not really susceptible to like issues with being too coastal, which is fantastic because we do have a lot of issues with that. I live super coastal and I have a lot of powdery mildew issues on some of my plants. Uh, this is not going to get that. But if you put it in too much shade, what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot less flowers and it's going to get super lanky so it won't be very attractive so six hours at the very very minimum of sun is what you're looking for they could do okay in containers as long as uh, it's a big enough container because you don't want to cram a plant that's going to get really big up above into too small of a container. So always think about that. If a plant gets big, you want to make sure that you have it in a big pot. If a plant is going to be a little small, plant okay in a smaller pot. And I always tell everybody, go big on your pots. As big as you can go, much more easier on you, less maintenance for you, less watering for you, all that good stuff. So I always tell everybody, go as big as you possibly can on your container for sure. I guess that answered the, the question was, okay. that, can the plants be planted in the ground yeah. and, and grown or they can be in pots? Both, they can okay. go absolutely in both. Make sure that you're using a really good quality potting soil and that it's very well draining. Uh, make sure that your pot has a big enough hole in the bottom. Um, so you want a hole that's like the size of a quarter-ish, a little bit smaller than that's fine. Um, but make sure that it's draining really well. Uh, so that's really the key with these is they don't want to be waterlogged. So uh, they can take a lot of water, they can take very little water, they can take hardly any fertilizing, they can take really fertile soil, but they cannot be waterlogged. That is the big thing with these guys. So if you've got really, really clay soil, definitely get in there and start amending it and make sure that you're not watering every single day for just a couple minutes. Make sure that you're watering deeply, but not keeping that top of the soil constantly moist all the time because they can't deal with that. And it looks like we've got another question. Are they drought tolerant? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, they they do, they're not so drought tolerant in the way that you can plant this with like a bunch of agaves that you only water maybe like every three weeks. They need a little bit more than that. Uh, so I would say with these guys, at least once a week watering uh, would be really important to them when we get super duper hot, which is that gonna happen? I don't know, I don't really want it to happen. So I'm not trying to will this into the universe. So uh, just putting it out there. But if we start getting really, really hot, maybe like two times a week, but these are native to Mexico and to Texas. So that gives you kind of a view of what kind of water they can actually uh, take and what kind of environments they're looking for as well. Another question is, at what point can I start training them to be trees? Okay, yeah, so you can start that ASAP. Um, you're gonna look for one that has a really nice central leader to it, and they will definitely need some supporting. So there's a lot of really, really great videos. I was actually looking at it all yesterday on how to trim them like little trees. Um, tons of amazing uh, YouTube videos on how to do that um, but you're going to look for one that has a really nice central leader to it so you don't want something that's all branched out super low it's going to be really hard uh, to find your leader and to train it to that degree so because you're going to have to take uh, a stake of some sort and actually tie it to that and you don't want to have one that's all crookedy on the bottom you want to start with something as straight as possible um, so you would look for one that has a nice central leader you would find your stake now you would last that leader to that stake right away um, and then start trimming off the stuff that comes off below that and you may have to continue to do that for quite some time where if you have a trunk and if you have any kind of patio tree that's really a large shrub shaped like a tree that's what we call patio trees or lollipop trees um, you may have to trim stuff occasionally off that trunk part because it will still want to grow some stuff out of that um, but you can start that right away just look for the shape the shape is really the the most important thing. I tell everybody that on all plants that you get, no matter what shape you want them to be, eventually don't pick a plant just because it's 
loaded with flowers, pick the plant that has the best shape. So that's really key for roses. Uh, so you want to pick something with a good shape because shape doesn't change. Everything will eventually get flowers on it. So, uh, but absolutely you want to start that as soon as possible and stake it as soon as possible and start lashing it to that stake to kind of uh, guide it to be tall and um, have that nice central leader so you can create that head eventually. Uh, but all kinds of amazing videos. I, I watched way more than I should have yesterday. <laughs> So, um, but uh, there's there's great videos and for espaliering too. Um, they really are beautiful for that, especially the um, compense style um, works really well for espaliering where that's, you're putting it on a wall essentially. It would need something to be tied to, but works really well for that, yeah. Uh, mine is six feet, when is a good time to trim? So it depends on what your variety is, but the good hard trim that you want it, and not really hard, you're really only gonna take maybe like a quarter to a third uh, down, but you wanna do that in late winter. So little fine tuning and just adjusting here and there is totally fine. You get like a rogue branch that goes really, really tall and kind of crazy, which these will sometimes do. Uh, you can go ahead and cut those whenever. Uh, they're not something that um, will get uh, super affected by cutting it you know throughout the year but um your real heavy shaping that you're going to do if you are going to do some heavy shaping on that um do that in the late winter time um so you can shape it up and it depends on what your variety is so hopefully you know what the name of it is and definitely look that up so you know kind of ultimately how big it can be um so you're not cutting it back too hard i tell everybody it's always super important to look at the plant see what the ultimate size is and make sure that you're planting it in an appropriate place the last thing you want to do is take a Tacoma that's naturally a 12 foot Tacoma and try to keep it only six feet tall I'm not saying that's what you're doing but I'm just saying you want these varieties keeping them there totally this one's only four by four uh, this one's only five foot um, if you wanted to keep this one three foot tall that would be fine uh, if you wanted to keep this one like three foot that would probably be okay too uh, but you don't want to take something that naturally wants to be really big and keep it super super small for one it's just a lot of maintenance on you but eventually it's going to get very woody because you're trying to cut it back all the time and you're going to lose some of that really beautiful new growth on it by cutting it back too much but your big prune you want to do at the end uh, of winter so before spring hits is when i would suggest doing that so probably around the same time you do your roses if you have roses at home that's a good indicator for you that it'd be time to do this too Awesome. Other, cool. other than people are complimenting you on how funny you are and they love your hat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for tuning in. It's always so much fun doing this with you guys. I love talking to everybody about plants. That's what I do all day long. I love being able to bring you something new if you can't come into the garden uh, as often. Uh, so that way you know what we have going on here and you can see all those great things. Uh, you can always call us if you have any questions. We do uh, local delivery too. So if you can't make it into the nursery for some reason, but you're like, I need one of these in my life you can always call us and we can have it delivered to you as well uh, there's tons of plants available on our website tons of roses available on our website too I was just looking through it and I think we had 350 roses available for ordering which is pretty amazing uh, but there's all kinds of fun things going on here and make sure you sign up for our email uh, our email list is amazing we send out so much great information you'll know about all the fun things we have going on here uh, we have the Audubon Society come in a couple of times uh, this summer so uh, they're not coming in again, but uh, it's something you want to stay in tune for so you know what kind of things we have going on. Uh, we have all kinds of great things where we have painters coming in and they show you how they create these beautiful things. If you haven't been into our gallery, we sell all kinds of really beautiful original art pieces here. Um, and you'll know about all the fun things we have going on here. We show you all that stuff. So thank you so much for that. Uh, make sure that you uh, check out our YouTube page as well. Uh, on our YouTube page, we have all kinds of information for everything possibly that you can want to know about from table settings to Halloween to Christmas uh, to Father's Day gifts all that kind of stuff plants how to prune things how to water things all kinds of amazing things going on there as well so make sure you check that out and subscribe to that page so you see all the great videos that come out as well too and uh, tag your friends down below who are those big hummingbird people uh, so let them know what we have going on here because we're gonna be wrapping up pretty soon you don't want to miss out uh, on all the beautiful hummingbird feeders and stuff we have all over here and be well and be safe and happy gardening, everybody. Bye.